from the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies. I want to again thank everyone for joining us today for the webinar, uh, Free Roaming Cats, Issues and New Ideas for Their Survival. Uh, again, thank you to the PEA, uh, PEI Humane Society, the Sir James Dunn Animal Welfare Center at the University of Prince Edward Island, and of course to our, uh, Dr. Margaret Slater for working with us today on this important topic. Um, we have uh, quite a few people on, uh, on the line right now. We have over 180 people registered, so it's uh, obviously it's a very big topic for people uh, across uh, North America and, and even down into the Caribbean. We have quite a few people uh, from, uh, from the Virgin Islands on today, so welcome to everybody. Before I turn the floor over to Barbara Cartwright, the CEO of the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies, uh, there are just a few housekeeping items I wanted everyone uh, to know about. First off, again, due to the size of the group, uh, we have muted all of your phone lines. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, and, and, and uh, Dr. Slater already alluded to it, there is a chat box function over on the, uh, it should be on, over on the right side of your screen. Please feel free to type in any questions or comments that you have. Um, if there are any cl clarification questions, uh, we'll, we'll cover those off during the presentation. If not, uh, if there are more general questions, what we'll do is uh, Dr. Slater has allotted some time at the end to, uh, to tackle those questions. Uh, secondly, the webinar will be recorded uh, and it will be available to everyone after the event. So if there are any reason you have to drop off, uh, you'll still be able to take advantage of the content. Uh, that should be in about a week or so, and once that's ready and up online, uh, you'll all receive an email with a link to the archive. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Barbara Cartwright for a few words on today's event. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. As David said, my name is Barbara Cartwright, and I am the CEO of the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies which is the only national organization representing humane societies and SPCAs in Canada. We bring together those who work with and care for animals to drive positive progressive change to end animal cruelty, improve animal protection, and promote the humane treatment and respect of all animals in Canada. To this end, the crisis that we're experiencing with cats here in Canada and indeed across the continent is a focus that we're working on to change with our members. As such, we have convened a task force to quantify the problems we all face and look for solutions so that we can provide a comprehensive practical report for people working on the ground with cats. If you're interested in participating in the research, we certainly welcome you. Please let us know. You can email back to us at any time and let us know. It'll be happening over the next few months. And Kelly Mullally, who sits on the task force and as well sits on the board of uh, directors for the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies, is the person who contacted us about Dr. Slater being here in Canada and the possibility of having her to do this webinar. Kelly is the executive director of the Prince Edward Island Humane Society, one of our partners in this webinar. The PEI Humane Society was formed in 1977 and operates the only animal shelter on Prince Edward Island off the east coast of Canada, for those of you not from Canada, for lost, abandoned, and homeless companion animals as well as providing animal protection and cruelty investigation province-wide. The PEI Humane Society is a registered nonprofit organization and receives no operational funding from any level of government. Our other partner in bringing you this wonderful webinar is the Sir James Dunn Animal Welfare Center at the Atlantic Veterinarian College of the University of Prince Edward Island, which promotes the animal welfare through research, service, and education. Mr. James Dunn Animal Welfare Center has funded a trap neuter relief program at the Atlantic Veterinarian College for over 10 years now in association with the community-based PEI Cat Action Team, which works with people across the island to help stray, feral. And of course, I'm proud and pleased to be able to introduce to you Dr. Margaret Slater, who is our guest speaker today. Dr. Slater is a veterinarian and an epidemiologist who has worked in private practice and as a professor of epidemiology at Texas A&M University. Her focus has been on health and disease in companion animals, including research on chronic disease, questionnaire evaluation, and pet overpopulation. She joined the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in 2008 
and currently provides epidemiological and statistical support for staff across the ASPCA with an emphasis on animal shelter-focused research. She is internationally recognized for her work on the sources, problems, and potential solutions for free-roaming cats and dogs. Dr. Slater has authored over 85 peer-reviewed publications and two books, and she's here on the island, on Prince Edward Island right now and has agreed to spend the next hour with us talking about free-roaming cats. Dr. Slater, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. So um, if anybody has trouble hearing, uh, hopefully they'll communicate by sending me a, a little email in the chat. Usually these things go pretty well once we get to this stage of the game. I picked the title that I picked, New Ideas for Their Survival, in parentheses, because free roaming cats often end up being euthanized. That's their survival, the cat's survival, but also as a play on words because of our survival, because of all the time and energy that people spend trying to save cats and how that can be really exhausting for us and, and burn us out and cause us not to survive and continue in this area. So that was my play on words. I'm going to talk about um, a number of different topics, and I've um, collapsed quite a few different things into this one hour. So I'm going to touch on a lot of different things fairly briefly. I'm going to talk about um, why we're why some of the reasons that we're having issues with cats and having this conversation now. I'm going to talk about trap, neuter, and return and issues, the key things that I think come up commonly relating to free roaming cats and TNR. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about population dynamics, which um, sounds complicated, but helps us address the question of how many cats do we have to spay? And then talk a little bit about targeting spay and neuter to get the most bang for your buck. And these things are actually all interrelated, but they're a little bit separate in um, how I'm going to present them. So you'll be able to see how they come together. And I know that this is a very varied audience, so some of these things will be total review to you, and some of them may be quite new. Um, and it'll just depend on your background. So free roaming cats, just to get a definition, what you know, so you know what I mean when I say that. Free roaming cats are cats that are at large. They're allowed to roam um, beyond an owner's home or property. They can be owned cats, allowed out. They can be what are sometimes called neighborhood or community-owned cats. They can be stray cats, which I generally define as a cat who's been owned but has been lost or abandoned. And then they can also be feral cats. And these are cats that are, very practically, cats that are too unsocialized, too afraid of people to be handled and live in a home. So although we talk about free roaming cats as an umbrella term, there's really a lot of subgroups. And what we can do with them and how we can prevent them is a little bit different. The other point that I want to make that's really important and that it sounds like you folks are recognizing and working towards are that no one tool, no one approach is going to fix the problem. You need community-wide programs to make a difference. You need spay and neuter, and you need it to be accessible, both physically and financially, to people who need it. You need vaccination against rabies and other infectious diseases. And that's t that spay and neuter is going to include TNR. You need a sort of a way of connecting the community so that um, if there are places that people should go to get cats and places that they really shouldn't go, there's a place for them to ask and someone who can tell them. We need, as we all know, we've done education for a long time, we need to try and find good ways of getting, uh, getting uh, people to understand responsible pet ownership. And what are the issues? What are the real issues? What do we actually know about the reality of trap, neuter, return, and free roaming cats? And one of the big things that I think um, we've talked a lot about with dogs but are still a little bit uncomfortable with is uh, identification in cats. And I like to suggest that they have a visible identification, a collar and tag, as well as a microchip for backup. The other pieces that need to be in place is some sort of a great adoption program, which is usually going to involve fosters because there aren't enough places to put kitties. And there are a lot of cats that don't do well in a shelter setting. Um, we need to consider whether we might be able to modify the habitat where cats are living. If you have cats um, that are living behind a row of restaurants because the garbage dumpsters are always open, 
can you get people to keep those dumpsters closed and clean the area up? If you do that, cats will actually go away because there's nothing for them to eat. I'm a little bit of an anarchist. I don't like a lot of laws and ordinances. I like a few things. I think any cat that's allowed outdoors should be sterilized. I think any cat that's allowed outdoors should have some kind of identification. And for uh, feral cats, that might just be the ear tip as part of their spay and neuter. And then if a cat is identified, they get a free ride home. They get something for that. They don't end up in the shelter. People don't necessarily have to pay. And the other thing that I think is really helpful, and, and every place has their own laws about what uh, constitutes ownership of cats, but in some places, if you feed a cat for two days, you, you own it. So you are then liable for all of the laws in that area, which may be a limit law, how many cats you can have. It may be you're not allowed to feed cats in public. It may be it has to be vaccinated or this and that. So I think that it makes better sense that you can only own a socialized cat, and then feral cat colonies are managed in a different way or handled differently from a legal perspective. So that's a long laundry list. I'm only going to touch on a few pieces of that, mostly the spay, neuter, and TNR. Um, my pictures are from all over the world, actually. My various friends, family, and relatives um, take pictures of cats wherever they travel. This one, I think, is Brazil. So I'm going to talk a little bit about trap, neuter, and return. For some of you, that's going to be very familiar. Uh, at its most basic, it involves um, trapping a cat in a humane wire tra trap, spaying or neutering the cat, ear chipping the cat, and in most places, giving the cat a rabies vaccination. And why should we be thinking about trap, neuter, return? I'm a little bit of a pragmatist. In many places, people have been trapping and removing cats on complaint for decades, and nothing has changed. There's still as many cats coming into the shelters, and there's still as many complaints coming in from those areas. So if that solution were to work, I would have expected to see some efficacy by now. So what happens if we think about doing something else? Well, we could do nothing. There won't do much relative to cats, and that doesn't help anyone. So the advantage of having something like trap duty and return is that not only does it give you a chance to help the cats, but it can be a great lever to um, get other people in the community, other partners in the community, and organizations involved to share the costs and share the time. The alternative that most people, um, most people recommend is remove and euthanize cats. And we don't talk, they don't talk about as, as eradication for the most part, except on islands, because you really can't get rid of every single cat um, by killing it. Uh, except in closed populations like small islands. These are just two quite famous islands. There's been lots of work, research done, lots of publications. And although they were only talking about, in most cases, a few thousand cats, it took them years, 20 years on Marion Island, to get rid of cats, all of them. And they infected them with um, horrible cat diseases. And they spotlit trapped them, uh, shot them. They trapped them with, um, with traps of various sorts, and they poisoned them. And in fact, catching and killing cats, the best way to kill cats is to poison them. Still, that isn't enough, but that's one of the most effective methods. And it's very expensive and very time consuming. These are on islands. Imagine what it would be like in a really big island. I know many of you live on islands here in Canada, but on a really big island or in a metropolitan area where none of these things are practical. Oops, there we go. So the long-term goal of trap, neuter, and return is to end up with fewer cats. That is the long-term goal of all reputable organizations doing trap, neuter, and return. One of the things that I definitely encourage people to do is vaccinate against rabies, because I think from the public health perspective, that's a good public relations approach, um, unless you're in Hawaii. And uh, I also really, really think it's important to try and ear tip or ear notch cats for identif permanent identification. There's actually some new research going on looking for other ways of identifying cats. Um, it's in its very early stages, and if we find out, we'll let you know. If you have an ongoing caretaker, that's going to be the most effective, because that person will see if new cats come in who need to be neutered, and um, will also be able to address any health issues or, or illnesses or injuries that the cats might have. And then adoption is always a good thing, because if you have a place to get these cats off the street into homes, that tame adult cats and the young kittens who can be socialized um, get taken out of the colony and then immediately reduces the number of cats on the street. By sterilizing cats, we decrease the fighting and the roaming. 
uh, the yowling, the noise, those are all sexual related, related behaviors in cats. Since they're not breeding, there's no litters, there's no unwanted kittens, and there's um, less stress on the females because they're not producing a couple of litters of kittens every year. We have documented that they gain, uh, they gain weight. They seem to improve in health, but we've actually shown where they followed up cats post-neuter, post-spay, and just like our pet cats, if they sit around a lot and they eat the same amount, they get fat. Anecdotally, the caretakers certainly tell us that they become more sociable, their coat quality gets improved, and they tend to spend a fair bit more time hanging around. We also know that down the road, some of these cats that were feral, were unsocialized at the time we neutered them, become socialized over time and actually become adoptable. This is a program um, that's an example of that. There's a, not, a lot of trap neuter return being done on um, university campuses. This was one where the people in charge were really into data, and so they, they tracked all of these cats. This is an 11-year period of time. They had a total of about 150 cats. After five years, they had half that number of cats. And by the end of the 11 years in 2002, they were down to 23 cats. That was 15% of the original. There are a couple interesting things here. One is that these cats had lived at least seven years Half of these cats had lived at least seven years or more on this campus. So some of these cats had been there a really long time. The other interesting thing is that over time, this shows some of these 47% of cats that were adopted, that's almost half the cats were removed through adoption, weren't adopted right away. They were adopted down the road when they socialized. They did have a percentage that disappeared, um, and some that were euthanized, a few that died, and a few that moved to nearby woods. I've actually spoken to some folks recently, and I think they're down to eight cats on this campus. And part of the reason they said it worked is because they also neutered cats in a ring all the way around campus so that there wasn't this influx of cats to keep pushing in onto campus. This is part of a, a project, this next slide, that was done in North Carolina in the US. And they had six, six colonies that were very similar. Um, there were at least 10 cats, at least three male cats. And uh, they weren't in a city or right near a road. So they tried to make these colonies very similar. And they went in and they sterilized them and they dewormed them. And they were all being fed. They had an average decrease of 36% um, across two years. By three years, one colony no longer existed. And one was down to just one or two cats. So that's pretty dramatic across a short period. Over the same time period, three very similar colonies that were not neutered had an average increase of almost 50%. And one of the things we find is that not only did cats increase, but they increase at variable rates. And these three colonies range from a 30% increase to almost a 300% increase. So how fertile and how many new cats came in was very variable from place to place, from colony to colony, even in this small area in part of North Carolina where the colonies were quite similar to start with. That makes it hard when we're talking about cats to know exactly what's going to happen. One very common um, publication is cited. This is by a student, uh, well, he was a student, uh, named Castillo was the last name. They looked at two colonies in southern Florida. These were in parks, so they were in very high visibility locations. They went in once and did, did spay neuter and found that um, a year later, 65 of the original 89 cats were still there. So about two-thirds of the cats were there. Um, but almost 50 new cats had come in. And this does illustrate that in some cases, cats are not territorial enough to keep new cats out. They also didn't do adoption, so no cats were removed. And they only did TNR once. Um, there's a couple of things that come out of this. And to my way of thinking, it's very, very um, informative because this was a highly visible place. This meant that a lot of these cats were likely abandoned. And when you're keeping colonies in very visible places, abandonment, when people feel there are no other choices, tends to happen. My guess is that people in the area felt that there was no place better than this park for their cats to go. Rather than the presence of colonies could encourage it, but it's really a symptom of other problems in the community and, and uh, a distrust or a lack of shelters altogether. So the take home message is that a one time trap neuter return event isn't going to help you. That if you don't take out socialized cats and, and young kittens, the colony numbers aren't going to go down. 
and that you need to have other pieces in place besides TNR because people have cats that they can't keep and they need to have a place they feel they can take them. This program in Massachusetts is right on the coast. And it's a really good example of a community-wide program. I haven't outlined the whole thing here. But they, in their first 15 years, they did about 6,000 cats in these small towns um, nearby the main town. And Newburyport's the main town. It's a little coastal town that does a lot of tourism. There are about 300 ferals that they neutered originally. Um, 15 years later, they were down to less than 20 ferals in town. They were all over 12 years old. They've been there a long time. By 2008, which was um, 18 years, there were no cats left on the waterfront. Now, in the last couple of years, they're down to just a handful of cats. And there are actually places where they're having rodent problems because they don't have any cats. So they're debating what to do. Um, one of the reasons this worked so successfully is because they discovered, although they started with TNR, they discovered that really part of the problem was people didn't have a place to take cats. The nearest shelter was not nearby, and it already had lots and lots of cats, and people felt they had no choice. So they put into place a cat-only, no, no um, limit, limited admission shelter where cats could come. They put into place a lot of education, a lot of problem solving and behavior help, um, low-cost spay neuter, whole spectrum of programs, and that's why it's been so successful in, in this little town. So that's some of the good part. Um, but we all know that this is controversial, in some cases extremely controversial. And what we're going to talk about now are just a couple of the high points that I think pop up over and over again. One of them is public health. Um, this, these photos were taken in Italy. And zoonoses are diseases that are transmitted between people and animals and vice versa. And in this case, most people are worried about cats transmitting diseases to people. Public health officials, their job is to address the possibility of this disease transmission. How often it happens is unknown in most cases, and it's actually not really what their job is. Their job is to worry that it could happen and how can they prevent it. In our cases, we actually, when we're talking about cats, we're talking about free-roaming cats, the frequency of disease transmission from a feral cat or a free-roaming cat to a human, there's nothing that, nobody that collects those data. And it's not just feral cats. And it's not just cats. It can be dogs. It can be horses. It can be anything that can transmit these diseases. So we tend to get hung up on these feral cats and on free-roaming cats. But really, it's a much larger question. I'm going to talk about just two diseases. One is rabies, and one is toxoplasmosis. Rabies is something that people are very fearful of, because if you get it, you almost always die. Historically, rabies control um, restricted the movement of animals, removed free-roaming animals, and vaccinated animals that could catch rabies. And this involved quarantines and trap and euthanized programs. The current recommendations, which actually are old now, they were late 80s, and there's a new set that have come out in the 90s and 2000s as well, because there's a lot of international work on rabies, have said that you have to know what's going on between the people and the animals in the community, and you have to develop mechanisms to address rabies that are culturally appropriate. That is, it has to work in the location you're working in. So if we're talking about trap and remove in an urban, suburban area, even a rural area in the United States or in Canada, if you remove cats, you never catch them all. That means you've left behind some cats who are unvaccinated and multiplying. However, if you're doing trap due to return and you're vaccinating these cats, then every cat you touch and put back has been vaccinated against rabies. And therefore, a fair number of cats, if not all of them, have already been vaccinated at least once. One of the things that happens is that the public health officials say, well, remove all the cats, and then the rabies threat will go away. But because you can never remove the cats, that doesn't help you with the rabies threat. It doesn't work because people don't like it, and it doesn't work because the vaccination is way more effective and in fact, seems to be the only thing that's effective in controlling rabies in these large populations. One of the things that when we started a program at Texas A&M University was that we said, well, you know, we can't catch all these cats and revaccinate them every year. What are we going to do? And they said, well, you're doing your best. You're educating people. You're trying to keep people from being bitten. You're trying to retrap and revaccinate these cats. That is way more defensible legally. And you'll get different opinions. But they said it's more defensible 
than knowing these cats are out there, knowing rabies are out there, and not doing anything. The other disease I want to touch on is toxoplasmosis. This is an issue for people and also for other wildlife. The reason that cats, felines in general, not just domestic cats, but all felines, are required as part of the life cycle for this particular parasite. Toxoplasma is a, is a parasite. And um, cats poop it out uh, for a short period of time after they're first infected, and the little organisms hang out in the environment, and they're infectious for a long time. People usually get this disease by eating undercooked meat, um, but you can also get it by gardening. If the, if the organism's in, in the soil and you don't wash your hands, you can eat it. The big concern for people is catching the disease during pregnancy for the first time because it can cause fetal malformations. There's also been suggestions that there's other kinds of health issues that Toxo can cause. Um, and it's an issue for immunosuppressed people because it can um, reoccur in immunosuppression. But the thing is, is that this is shed by young hunting cats. If we've neutered these cats, and they're an older population now, and not a young turning over population, these cats aren't shedding the organism anymore. And they won't shed it likely for the rest of their life. So it doesn't really make sense to um, to continue to have young shedding cats, young cats shedding this organism, if we could have older cats who don't shed the organism. That's an insta view of public health issues and cats. Wildlife is the other big topic. In the US, at least, there's been an enormous push. There's a big propaganda push uh, against cats. Uh, by a number of the large wildlife organizations. And so there's been a lot of materials written lately. <clears throat> One of the points that I want to make again, and I've, I've said this in another context already, is that the interaction of cats and wildlife and birds is not going to be the same everywhere. If you're in a big urbanized area, there's not going to be a lot of wildlife that's in danger. There's pigeons and there's starlings and those kind of critters and rats and mice. But that's not the same as in, if you're in a park or in a nature area or on a farm. Island ecosystems, and again, it depends on how big, the, big and small the island is, or places that have already been damaged because of human intervention are much more um, fragile. And it turns out, of course, that anyone who knows about ecology and biology, that these are complicated systems. And cats interact with other species, introduce species like rats, who can be very nasty and predatory in the environment, and other native species. And if you just remove cats, that can cause an enormous problem if you haven't tracked down what their interactions are with the other animals in the environment. So it's really hard to extrapolate from one study location to another and from one um, town or one type of area to another. The other thing that you commonly hear about wildlife is um, that the justification for removing cats is because they're not native. They're an introduced species, much like most of us. The assumption here is that protecting nat native wildlife is always our primary goal, and that if we move the cats, things will return to normal. Neither of those is true, because there are certainly times where we um, kill native species like wolves and coyotes to protect domestic species like cattle and sheep. And even other, we eat, sometimes kill native species to protect other native species. And the ecology, the ecosystems are much too complex for things to go back to normal. Cats are only one of the pressures that have happened. Uh, we've generally changed how the rain falls, how the fire happens. We've bulldozed things. We've modified the habitat. It's not going to go back to the way it used to be. The other philosophical objection, which is certainly viable and uh, legitimate, is that cats are domestic species. Therefore, it's our responsibility to protect native wildlife from what's a, what is a, a, native, a, a domestic species. And because we feed cats, their numbers in the wild aren't regulated the same way as a wild species, where you know a fox or a coyote, as, as prey goes up and down, their numbers go up and down. But if you're getting cat crunchies every morning, the numbers of cats aren't going to go up and down. So the idea here is that uh, people believe that others should um, not value cats over wildlife, but instead we should control or confine our cats. And I don't argue with that at all. 
but I, I do um, want to make people think that about the fact that these cats didn't appear here magically or on their own. They were put there deliberately or accidentally by people. And I don't think it's um, legitimate for them to pay the price because of something people did. OK. So we're going to change gears a little bit. And I'm going to talk about population dynamics. Um, this is a cat uh, in Italy following the big earthquake there a few years back. I love this picture because he's got his little feet going, and he's hoping somebody's going to take him home. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about populations and population dynamics. Don't worry, there's not lots of math or anything. Um, but I want to give you a sense of where, um, what information is needed and what kinds of numbers people get when you say, how many cats do you have to spay? So to do that, I'm going to give you a little background. Populations are groups of animals that live together and reproduce together. So um, in some cases, for us, Cats in a shelter might be a population, even though they're not reproducing together. But in many cases, a feral cat in a neighborhood, a feral cat colony, a group of free-roaming cats living in a particular county or province could be considered a population. It's just a group. The thing is, and here's the recurrent theme, different populations are likely different. And they're different in how those populations grow and change. There's four basic numbers that you need to know about populations. They're not complicated. It's what you do with them that gets complicated. Um, there's birth rates and death rates. That is, how fertile are these cats? How many kittens can cats pop out? There's death rates. What's the mortality or survival of cats? How long, you know, how, uh, what's an average life expectancy is another way of thinking about that. Then if you have populations that are open to movement, I talked about closed populations where these are cats on an island. There's no way that new cats can come in or move out, because it's bigger. It's a small island. There's lots of ocean. They're not swimming in and out. But in most cities, most farms, uh, most parks, there's no boundaries that keep cats in or out. So there you get the other two vital rates. That's immigration, cats moving into the population, and emigration, cats moving out of the population. Here's where you need to know what the population is. If I'm looking at a population as a colony of cats living in a park, then immigration, new cats, could be because a cat got abandoned. And emigration, leaving that colony, could be because somebody adopted a cat out of that colony or because somebody trapped a cat and euthanized it out of that colony. These are just some general parameters now for population growing. And if you stop and think about it, these are very logical. So births and immigration, cats coming in, are things that make the population grow. They make the population get bigger. Deaths and emigration, cats leaving the population, make the population smaller. If you have more births and immigration than deaths, the population is going to grow. And that's typically what we see. And we commonly see immigration, new cats coming in, as well as births. Both things often go on. If you have a closed population, and your birth rate and your survival rate are, and your mortality rate are similar, then those things balance each other. You get a stable population, and you get zero growth. If we can influence the birth rate, and that's what TNR does, is influence the birth rate by sterilizing cats, and all other things stay equal, then we'll drop the birth and immigration side of the, of the formula, and the population will decrease. So that's what TNR is trying to do, and that's how it influences this population dynamic. If you stop and think about it, Trapping cats, removing cats, and euthanizing cats, if we're euthanizing cats, then we're influ influencing the death rate. We're influencing survival. And so trap and remove programs influence survival. And they filter into the, the equations a little differently. <coughs> this is the result of a little model that we did. <coughs> Excuse me. Where we said, OK. And we did a lot of different permutations. There's a lot of variability in birth rates and in death rates. This I'm just presenting you with sort of the average middle of the road figures. If you have an average group of cats and you want to know how many to sterilize to um, stabilize the population, you need to spay about 50% of the adult and juvenile female. There's two things here. One is I'm only talking about girls. Um, and that's primarily because there's usually enough boys to go around. And so girls are the rate-limiting step. 
The second thing is that we looked at juveniles, and those are cats a, less than a year old versus adult cats a year and older. Because of the, the mortality rates, we all know that kittens don't survive as well as adults. They also don't, aren't going to be reproducing. Their litters will be smaller. There will be fewer litters. So we needed to take that into account. So you need to do it in a mid-range fertility and a mid-range um, life expectancy for a free-roaming cat, you need to do about half the, the adult and juvenile females in the population. That means that on average, all the time, 70% um, of the total females will be spayed and 80% of the adult females will be spayed. If you don't do juveniles and you only do adults, and this is cats one year and up, then you need to do 91% of the adult females to get the same stabilization of population. So already I'm talking about a couple of different levels. And many of you have probably heard 70 or 75%. That comes out of um, some other extrapolations. But here's one scenario. And this, this particular paper, which uh, the reference for this is at the end uh, of the presentation, um, we looked at a bunch of other ranges of fertility and survival so you could see what these figures could be. We were also interested in looking at a three-year contraceptive. That's what started this conversation. And um, we th I, my original gut was that three years, that's not long enough. But at these mid-range survival and mortality and um, birth rates, turns out you only need to contracept 60% of the cats. So we're talking 51% versus 60%. Not a big difference. So actually, a three-year contraceptive for cats who, whose populations are middle of the road in terms of survival and fertility could be quite useful. Unfortunately, it's never quite that easy, and there's lots of birth and death rate data. Um, we Just looking in the literature, there's quite a very, bit of variability. The other piece, there's a couple big pieces we don't know about, and one of them is that we don't know, we think, but we ha don't have good data to suggest whether, once we've spayed the cats, whether that changes their survival. And I'm guessing it probably does, but we don't know, we don't know about it yet. We know there's some seasonal effects and there's some climatic effects, and we haven't accounted for that. Um, the males, I mentioned that we assumed there were enough males available to breed all the available females. There's probably some areas where that's not true, and then we'd have to take that into account as well. So the key things that um, we were looking at here that we really sort of surprised us or confirmed things we had already thought were twofold. One is You've got to aim at the juveniles as well as the adults, the guys less than, the females less than a year old, because that gives you the most bang for your buck. You're most likely to prevent a litter at all, and down the road, when we're looking at these, these populations, that's going to be the most uh, hopeful and helpful. The other thing, and I'll come back to targeting populations a little bit later, is that you need to target populations where you can get 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of the cats spayed and neutered. If you just do a cat here and a cat there, if you do a thousand cats scattered around, that's not going to impact the population overall. Those cats won't be reproducing, but the population itself will still be growing. If you do all the cats in a small group, then that population growth is zero, and you've stopped that population from growing. So you need to think about both those things. This is another pro uh, paper that was published fairly recently from um, eight uh, TNR sites uh, in South Africa on a university campus. They reported on about 190 cats. Um, just over half were sterilized overall, but they were divided into eight different locations. So they had some variability in the percentage sterilized and in some other factors. And what I've tried to do here is summarize that. So in a given colony, the higher the percentage of cats who were sterilized, the more cats who were sterilized, the fewer the number of cats. The higher the percentage that was sterilized, the higher the density of cats. In other words, the sterilized cats were willing to live in very close proximity with each other. And the more, the higher the percentage of cats who were sterilized, the fewer younger cats. Again, you sterilize the cats, they live there, they age. You don't have a lot of kittens growing. And that's not shocking, but they actually have the data that shows this. Their conclusion was that also that smaller colonies are easier to handle. They're easier to manage. They don't cost as much to, to get spayed and neutered, which means that you can get the sterilization to high levels. So when you're looking at this picture, 
To me, this means we want to break it into little bite-sized pieces that we can handle when we're doing TNR. Oops, my bad. Come on. There we go. You going to stay there? Good. This is a graph from that population. You can see their, their statistics on the bottom here. They had a pretty high survival rate, 85% very modest number of kit kittens produced, and some immigration. And they did some, um, some different lines. This started with a, about 23 cats and said, OK, if we follow it across five years, what happens? And this is the percent sterilization. So this top line is zero sterilization. You go from 22 cats to looks like 50 cats. Right here in the middle, where you start to get some good good action here, is about 57%. And down here at the bottom, where you get the, the lowest growth, essentially, you have 100% sterilization, so the population gets smaller just through death. This is pretty consistent with what we, what we saw in the, our hypothetical model. Um, and it's really interesting to see that they're getting similar numbers. Hmm. Are you behaving? There we go. Um, I do want to comment where uh, the Alliance for Contraception Cats and Dogs has been funded by the ASPCA to work on a simulation model that's a kind of population model for free arming cats. And we've got a guy who that's what he does for a living is do simulation models. And um, uh, so we're working on that. We hope to have some of that out by the end of the year. So things to think about. Each location is different. Cats are a herd problem, but trapping your return can be a really valuable tool, one of your tools. Adoption is a really valuable tool because you get the cats off the street. I know there are some areas where you just can't find homes, and that's an issue. The other thing I want to mention is um, decreasing, the, in addition to decreasing the numbers of existing cats through targeted spay, neuter, and juveniles, what happens about the sources of free arming cats? Um, this uh, picture is from Chile. That's my phone, sorry. <laughs> so how do we prevent new cats from entering the colonies? We want to decrease abandonment, and we want to do that through having a good option for people to bring their cats to the shelter. They should feel like their cats are going somewhere where they have a chance. That's not a horrible, grim, scary place. And we need to better understand reasons for abandonment. Um, a lot of cases we know are behavioral. Some are moving. Some are combinations of issues in the household and finances. But we don't have a really good handle on that. And most places don't have a good safety net for these kinds of issues. Um, and nowadays, I know with the, with the economy, in some cases, if you talk to people, we're finding that if somebody could just do one thing, they might be able to keep that cat. But there isn't a place to store the cat for a month, or there isn't $200 to get the cat fixed, or to have some health issue addressed. And that's just the straw that breaks the camel's back. We need to increase identification so that these cats don't end up here accidentally. And we need to decrease kitten production. And we know in cats, Everywhere we've looked and asked the question, the majority of cats have kittens accidentally. It's not something someone planned. They just had kittens. And that's because they didn't know when they could get start, when they could get pregnant, or they didn't know they could get pregnant by their brother, or whatever it might be. But so we need to really be thinking about early sterilization and education, just so that we have fewer accidental kitten litters. And then really the big question is, how do we get people to keep cats differently, to, to view, view cats differently. Um, and nobody has a good, a good answer to that. There's a number of programs out there. None of them have been evaluated for how well they, they work. When I speak, I often, especially to veterinarians, I also say, have you ever changed how someone keeps their cat? Have you ever convinced someone to keep their cat indoors? And with two exceptions, I've never had anyone tell me yes. People change how they decide to keep their cat because it's something that happens to them or their previous cat, or in their household. It's not something that's external. And, and you guys may have other experiences, and that'd be great. But so far, we haven't done, a, done much of a good job of really understanding that and changing it. And a lot of people think it's cruel to keep a cat confined. Um, 
is there a way to, to find a happy middle ground so the cat stays safe and the wildlife stays safe and the people stay safe and everybody's happy? All right. My last thing that I want to talk about is um, targeting cats who are most at risk to enter the shelter. Because in many places, that, particularly places that have open admission and have a very high volume, a lot of cats that enter the shelter are unfortunately euthanized. So those cats are often at the highest risk of death of any cats in the community. Now, who's at risk? Well, most places the free roaming cats are at risk, certainly, because if they're, if they're feral and they come in, they're going to be euthanized. Um, but in some cases, owned cats are also at very high risk, and especially if these cats are being relinquished. These cats may be at high risk to be euthanized. I love this picture. It's not mine. I stole it. How do we find cats who are most at risk? There are two cats looking out over a stone wall. That's a dog running on the beach. How do we know this? We get this through the data from shelters. And this is where my bias and, and the, in, in ways the ASPCA's push um, comes out because data tells you what's happening. It's how you can tell who's coming in, where they're coming from, and who's euthanized. I'm going to just show you a couple little quickies here. Um, we all know, well, we all know, we all believe that um, low-income owners often have problems with the finances for getting their cats spayed or neutered. And this is a program in Florida in the United States that ta specifically targeted low-income residents. There's lots of programs that do this. This particular one actually has data about it. They followed this program for three years. Their, their um, pets who came in, they had a decrease in, in euthanasia across just a three-year period um, of 37%. Prior to the program, the shelters had an annual intake, intake increases of 15 to 20 percent. Two years after the program started, the sh county shelter intake was down 8 percent. So this isn't something that's a continuation of a trend. This was a new direction and a new change. And again, I know people are doing this program. This is one of the few where I could really, where I've seen good data that, that show efficacy. This is another program. This one is actually quite controversial. Um, this is a feral freedom program where cats who are doing well on the street, and now actually socialized cats as well as feral cats, are bypass the shelter and go straight to the spay neuter clinic. So if these are stray cats, they're coming in, they're being neutered, they're being returned to wherever they're living happily. You can see here, these are the live release rates, and you can see these are the live release rates hover 8 to 20%. Um, and then when they started this program, the live release rates skyrocket. And that's because these cats don't go into the shelters, so they don't get euthanized. They simply bypass that whole problem, process. Now, a lot of people have questions about this. Um, it's something that there's, there are a number of places working on, uh, trying out, trying to wrestle it. It's also a very expensive program. What if we really want to target even more? So we came up with the analogy. We're used to picking, a lot of us um, have been picking low-hanging fruit because we've got some, um, some interesting programs. In a few places, we can pick a few high-hanging fruit. These are people who are hard to get to come in and spay and neuter. But what we really want to do is pick all the fruit on one tree. We want to get this targeting idea happening, and we want to really hone in on getting all the fruit off of one tree, all the animals in one neighborhood, all the animals in one apartment building, all the animals in one problem location. How do we do that? If you're into technology, there are some new ways to do this. And uh, This is getting easier and easier. Many of you have heard about GIS. Probably a lot of you have used your GPS device in your car or have used something like Google Maps. And this is that same idea where you're graphing information to figure out how do you get from point A to point B. Only in this case, point A, point A and point B has to do with where are animals coming from, from your community into your shelter. And where are they going out of your shelter? You can do this for adoptions as well. Now I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. This is, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> a little technological glitch on this end. We're good. This is a graph. Um, using GIS, this is a map, and 
what it does is it maps litters coming into the shelter from a particular area around this town. And what we did was we defined litters are um, kittens coming in from the exact same address on the same day. And you can see here we have um, three to four kittens per litter, five to six kittens. These are probably not single litters, seven to nine and 10 to 12. But these are numbers of kittens that came in on the same day from the same address. And you can just look at this, and it gives you a little bit of a sense of um, where the litters are coming from. You can see there's a lot of litters in the middle. And then there's a few big, some of the bigger litters out here. And this is just a way of getting a really clear idea of where kittens are coming from. And this should be the area where it would be most easy for spay-neuter to impact. Because if you spayed the mothers, there wouldn't be kittens. So this would help you figure out exactly where you want to put most of your spay and neuter. You're probably going to not want to put spay and neuter up here. There's not a whole lot going on. You probably want to put it in here, which is exactly where this community decided to put it. This is another kind of graph. We're exploring different ways of visualizing this information. And um, we have now a project in partnership with PetSmart Charities where we have two staff who are working on um, GIS-related uh, mapping with three communities. This is one of our communities. And this is a way of looking at it by neighborhood. This particular city had very clearly defined neighborhoods. And we thought that that would be a really useful way because neighborhoods have um, neighborhood associations. They have activities. They're, they're kind of uh, a, a small chunk of a city that you can get your hands wrapped around. And this is pit bull type dog intake by neighborhood. And the darker, the more pit bull. So you can see there's a lot of pit bulls coming in from a couple of these neighborhoods, and not so many going on in some of these other neighborhoods. You can also see that a number of these dogs are coming in right on the divisions along these main roads. And that can be kind of a problem when you're looking at this kind of a square picture where, well, OK, is this dog coming from this neighborhood or from that neighborhood? So one of the ways to handle that is to do a graph like this. And this is something that's fairly new. We haven't done a lot of these. Um, we're still sort of trying them out with people to see if they make sense when we show them to folks who aren't familiar with this kind of work. These are kind of like you've seen this on the Weather Channel, where um, there's lots of rain or snow right here in the dark color, and you get less as you go farther out. And so you'll see that, that there, this big dark spot that we saw on the previous one, this is the same um, community, is still here. It's just shifted a little bit. And we're not confined by the neighborhood boundaries and the street boundaries. But we can look at what the data tell us. And this area is a big hot spot for pit bull intake. So is this area. But we're not too worried out here where the light colors are. So those are ways of saying, here's where our hot spots are. Here's where we need to be worried. Now, sorry, this is, pit, this is cats and not pit bulls on this graph. So I had a brief pit bull flashback. So in this case, we could also look at this by kittens versus adult cats. And we could say, or. We could do, if we had the data, we could look at intact adult cats versus altered adult cats if we kept the data on, on whether they were neutered at intake or not. And that would allow us to um, say, OK, we got lots and lots of intact adult cats right here. That's a great place for our spay neuter, right there. And if we put that there and we track these data for another year, we would expect this to go from being bright red to being, mm, I don't know, it depends on how good we are at getting all the fruit off of this tree, but we might get it down to a much lighter color. Or we might get it to go away altogether. But it actually turns out that it, it's a little more difficult than many of us think to reach those people who are really hard to reach, who we haven't reached already. They're not low-hanging fruit anymore, and we need to create new methods to get with them. So I've just given you a very brief idea of um, how these pictures can be kind of powerful. But you do need to have the information that makes these pictures. And that means you have to know where the cats are coming from, not where the people are coming from. If they picked up a stray cat, where did they pick up the stray, not where do they live. You also need to get pretty clean data. If you're going to look at it from the community level, and that's really the only way this is going to work, you have to have it. We are estimating about 80% of your addresses have to be clean and accurate. We also think that you're looking at a community you need to look at all the organizations in your community that are taking cats in, at least with any reasonable number of cats. And so we suggest that you need at least 85% of the intake coming in collecting the data. So again, you've got to work with each other. And then that allows you to select a target, 
select some cool intervention and try it out. And then you can monitor it, see if it works. And there's your map. You have, you'll get two maps, a before and an after, and you can see if they're going to work for you. We're in the stages of doing before and after. We don't have any good afters yet, which is why I haven't shown you any of those. But we know that sometimes we have to be quite creative. So this allows us to really identify where the high problem areas are, whether we're talking about kittens, adults, moms with kittens, owned cats, whatever it might be, um, inside and outside the shelter. And it's, it's, I know, much better now than when I first started talking about this, but for many years, if it didn't come in the shelter doors, it wasn't something that was of interest to people. We need to know where to target, and we need to monitor that and be able to document that what we're doing, where we're putting our money is helping. I know many of you are, are reporting to boards or funders or whatever it might be, or even your own pocketbooks, and you want to know that what you're doing is going to make a change. This new technology, the GIS stuff, there's freeware out there now. There's almost all the colleges and universities that have programs in it. Um, it's one of the sort of how-to tools that we're trying to put together is how do you do this, what data do you need, um, this information will be coming up on ASPCA Pro down the road. But we got to have this old-fashioned nitpicky attention to detail on data because that's what's going to give you the answers. Okay, so cats can be contentious. Um, you guys have probably all had that experience already if you're here on this call. Um, we have to be thinking about the welfare of the cats and the welfare of other animals and people. But I like to keep that, keep pulling that back to the context of what's possible. Yes, if I had a magic wand, I would do something different, but I don't have a magic wand. Um, GIS is a geographic information system, and it is a um, system, there was a question about that, it's a system of, of mapping data and looking at how data relate to each other. We're going to need a lot of different approaches, and that's where I started with our community approaches, including TNR and feral caretakers to make a difference. And then we want to be careful in picking our target so that we get them enough bang for a buck that we can show that our buck made a difference. Um, ASPCA Pro, this is us. The stuff that I talk about that gets out there, that gets published, um, that we're working on, our how-to tools for targeting, that will all go up on Pro. You'll be able to find it there. And um, I've got some references for a lot of these papers at the back of the uh, presentation. This is a cat in Italian sanctuary. In Italy, it's illegal to euthanize a cat unless he's terminally ill or a serious danger to someone else or, or a dog. So you don't get euthanasia as a population, a solution to population over, over uh, population problems. Okay, uh, it's right at about five o'clock. Um, I have time if people have questions. It's, uh, it's David here. We actually have quite a few questions uh, that came in through uh, through the chat. And what I'll do is I'll just uh, I'll start from the top and we'll work our way down. Uh, I think we can very easily cover them off uh, with just a few extra minutes here on the webinar. Uh, the first question is, where is the best place to target my charitable donation money to help free roaming cats? Should I set up a fund to pay for free spay neuter clinics, for example? And I guess that's a really general question. It's a good question. How do you know where you're going to get a good bang for your buck? Um, that's where your research comes in. See if there is a trap neuter return group in your area or if there's a shelter or other organization who's partnering with people doing trap neuter return. And generally, uh, an established organization, someplace that has a website, um, sometimes that helps. I also encourage you, if there's an organization working to, and you're, you know, and you're really seriously considering larger amounts of money, to call them and visit them. Any reputable organization will be happy to show you what they're doing and how they're doing it, and give you a tour, and it'll give you a sense of whether they're going to be a fly by night, um, whether they're using the latest um, guidelines for humane care of the cats, all that kind of jazz. Uh, and there's a lot of information on how people should be doing TNR and on what kinds of organizations are doing it uh, on the internet. Right, and the, the next question, uh, it's, it's more for, for CFHS, uh, how do, who do we contact to be part of the task force research? Uh, and I can answer that. This is Barb at the CFHS. Please send me an email directly to Barbara, B-A-R-B-A-R-A, -A -A, at C, F as in Frank, H, S, 
www.canadaaccess.ca, and you uh, need to be in Canada yeah. in order to participate in the actual data gathering, but other than that, we'll distribute the report far and wide afterwards. But any comments you have or questions, please email me directly. I'd be happy to hear from you. And this information will also go out in the email with the link to the archive of the webinar. Uh, next, next question is, I practice in a rural area, and one of the large problems I see is farms that do not try and control the number of cats on the farm. Essentially, Mother Nature controls the cat numbers. I'm sure that many of these end up in town. Do you know of any successful programs to get the rural community on board with controlling cat numbers? This can be a really hard one. It's a good question. Um, and it's a place where actually a non-surgical contraceptive or sterilism might really help, because if you could just say, I got to just give them a pop them a shot, people might, you might be able to get people on board more quickly. I don't know of any really well-organized programs have done this. Anecdotally, I've had people tell me you need to find who the opinion leaders in your community are rurally. In some parts of the country or parts of the world, it's the women on the farms who make some of those decisions. And if you can find one or two of those women who you can work with, neuter the cats, um, then there'll be less, less noise, um, less carrying on, uh, and get them to be successful with you, they will then carry the word to their buddies. A couple of the key questions key complaints that you'll hear is, I'll run out of cats. And the answer to that is, if you run enough cats, you call me any time, day or night, and I will ship you however many cats you need. And really, that you will hear that, that said, I will run out of cats. And then they say, well, you know, what, what do I care? There's always enough cats to deal with the rodents. And my answer is, I, I, my, I'm pretty sure that a healthy cat is going to be better at catching rodents than a sick, dying cat, quite frankly, um, although I can't prove that. And in some cases, you get a lot of nuisance behaviors from the intact cats. You get noise, you get spraying, you get um, dead bodies, you get those kinds of things. And if, you're, if your colony is neutered um, and vaccinated, you're not going to get a lot of that, so there'll be less nuisance, there'll be less of a problem. But it can be, that can be a very difficult group to get your foot in the door on. On the other hand, some of them, if you'll come and do the work for nothing, they'll let you come and, come and do it. Um, they're just not prepared to do anything themselves. So it kind of depends on what you want to do and how you want to handle that. Hey, quite a few of the other questions we have uh, were covered off in previous, uh, previous uh, answers. Uh, one more question related to the content. Um, I don't understand the bird-cat fight. We have seen it in our small area brought forward by naturalists encouraged by the American Bird Conservancy to do their best to stop TNR. I don't understand, since we're both trying to reduce the cat population, why they won't work with us. Any, any thoughts on that? That's a great question, um, because it's puzzled me for a long time. I know what it is. Um, uh, the bird folks feel that once we've trapped the cat and taken it in off the street, putting it back out again is a bad thing. Because we've removed it from the street, why would we put it back? Why don't we put it in a sanctuary or put it in a home? And um, there's two answers, and the answer to that is, well, some cats aren't socialized. We can't put them in a home. And other cats that are feral, uh, and other cats we can't find homes for. All of you have plenty of nice cats in your programs, I'm sure. Finding homes for more is going to be hard. Then they say, well, let's put them in a sanctuary. And all of you run shelters, and you know perfectly well how much it costs to care for a cat for its natural life and keep, it, keep him or her happy and healthy and well-fed and uh, emotionally healthy and all of those kinds of things. It's very expensive and rarely supervised well. Many of you have probably seen some really scary sanctuaries or shelters or people who started off trying, trying to do the right thing and ended up hoarding animals. Um, so their solutions aren't very helpful. And they don't understand why we have to put the cats back. Um, I, I agree. I think sometimes what you can do is take two steps back and say, well, really, we agree on 80% of the things. We think that owned cats should be confined um, or at least limited so they can't prey, pr predate birds very often. We agree cats should be sterilized. We agree they should have identification so they can get home and not get lost and get stuck on the street. We agree that um, they should be vaccinated against infectious diseases. We agree on all those things, in fact, almost all of the time. And so if you can step back, sometimes you can get them to find some common ground with spay-neuter, for example. Um, but in m many cases, you can't get past that initial, well, you're putting cats back 
conversation. Even though that's really a small fraction of the problem, that's dealing with the existing cats out there, not preventing new cats from getting out there, which is where we actually, I think, need to be putting a lot more of our resources and our time. We just don't have good ways of doing that. So if you can get them to have a little perspective and, and have a little longer conversation about it, sometimes that can be helpful. Um, sometimes it's kind of a knee-jerk, cats are bad, cats are evil, we need to remove all cats. Um, but sometimes it's a much more uh, of an educational conversation that they don't realize that there aren't that many homes, that they don't realize that sanctuaries are really expensive, that they don't understand that I'm not going to get people to donate their time and money to kill cats, but I can get them to donate their time and money to neuter cats. Um, and so it's kind of, sometimes it's just a reality check uh, for that. So that, but that's a really hard question. It's, it's very frustrating because there's been a lot of time and effort spent on by the, by American Bird Conservancy, by others, by Audubon, by some of the other organizations um, talking about the problems, but, and trying to understand how you get people to change their behavior. But so far, no one's come up with really good ways to do that. And we would all love to have people take much better care of their cats than they do every single one of us, and we just can't seem to get on that same page. And uh, just to finally here, we have quite a few questions about, uh, about the links to the archive version of the webinar, as well as uh, people are very interested in looking further into the references that, uh, that you've, you've just put up. Uh, again, this, uh, the whole presentation will be available within probably the next uh, uh, three to five business days. Once it is up, everybody will get an email with a link to uh, to the slideshow. So you'll have all this information available to you uh, in, in the next couple of days. Uh, I see here we don't have any more questions at this point. Again, thank you uh, to Dr. Slater, as well as uh, our friends at the PEI Humane Society, as well as the Sir James Town Animal Welfare Center at the University of PEI for today's presentation. And also thank you to all of you uh, attendees. Obviously, you're, you're caring and very compassionate about, about cats in your, in, in your areas, and, and you want to help solve the problem. So hopefully our webinar today uh, leaves you with some, some, some good areas to take a look at uh, uh, moving into, some, some new thoughts and, and new ideas. Uh, again, uh, thank you to everyone. And uh, Again, if you want to get more involved in the research that, uh, that we are doing from a cat overpopulation standpoint through our task force, uh, information about getting more involved in that will be included in the email or going up with the link to the archive. So at this point, uh, again, thanks to everyone. I uh, hope you enjoy a, a spring day wherever you are. And it now concludes today's webinar.